Hello. Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you to CNI Clifford for for giving us an opportunity today to uh, to share some of what we're learning with Jenny I. How many of you here were at the 9 a.m. session on Jenny I? That was okay. Okay, great. Um, you know, I think that this is obviously AI is everywhere. What we're going to be trying to do today is share with you what we're learning. I mean, we're not doing a kind of product demo. Um, you know, the world has changed since November 22, um, and some of you will remember this uh, two-hour transcript interview from the New York Times, I Want to Be Alive. Um, we've been working on machine learning and, and AI for, um, for a while now. Um, you know, prior to ChatGPT, we were working on things like building a semantic index to improve search, uh, building a citation graph of all the citations in JSTOR. Um, this is this is what was different when this when this came on board. The, the visualizing a conversation with the computer. Um, when you when you saw that happen, ChatGPT went from zero to one million users in five days. It reached 50 million people in five weeks, and they have 180 million users today. So this this idea of AI, which we you know I think all of us had been thinking about and knowing was coming, we're working on it. It, it kind of got a whole new life when you saw the computer have a conversation with a person. That was something that was dramatically different that really appealed to people's consciousness. And in our experience and at JSTOR, one of the things that I felt at that time was if you're not ha offering that conversation for users, I didn't know if it was going to be six months or a year or two years, but if when users came to your site, you were not having that conversation, you weren't going to be relevant. Like they were going to just go somewhere else. Like that, that, that convenience was going to be more important, maybe even than substance sometimes. And we've seen that in all of our experiences. And so we, we set about internally at, at Ithaca to really understand the impact of this. And so, you know, we, we actually use uh, a lot of the tools. Our, our, our general counsel, Nancy Copens, our legal group, uses a product called Co-Counsel, which is a GPT-enabled assistant, co-pilot. We recently started using something called Glean, which takes all of your internal documents from your intranet and allows your, your teams to, to do conversational queries and understand all of your policies and things like that. It's just really, really trying to become familiar with this and, and, and its impact because it's going to change everything. And we you know, wanted to be able to understand that and, and learn from it and share it with the community, which is, which is what we're going to try to do here today. Um, you know, our guiding principles for how we deploy these is first and foremost, we, we want to make sure we do this in ways that uphold, you know, not only our values, but the values of the scholarly community, uh, which includes equitable access to these tools. And, you know, some of the challenges that, that exist between haves and have nots in this, in this world. Um, we we want to learn and, you know, we know we need to move fast because everything else is moving fast, but we want to proceed cautiously and thoughtfully uh, and, and implement AI in ways that, that support the user experience and educational experience and not displace it. Um, and again, you know, we consider ourselves a learning organization. We talk about that a lot internally and we want all of our teams to be learning all the time and we want to be an organization that contributes to learning. And so that's what we're trying to do here is to share uh, some of those lessons um, about what we're doing. We, we're in a kind of a special place. We feel very fortunate. We have Ithaca SNR on one side of the Ithaca house and we have JSTOR on the other. And what I mean by this and that is that the Ithaca SNR team does research independently about things that are impacting the community. And then we have JSTOR where we have an operational entity that's actually engaged in using and doing these things. So those two things can inform each other and can help us inform the community. And we try to take advantage of that you know, whenever we can. Um, so we announced last May a project that's led by uh, Dylan Rudiger, um, which is a multi-year multi -year collaborative research project uh, that um, that is it focused on helping colleges and universities understand the impact of these technologies on them. Um, you know, it's uh, Danielle is also here. She was there to help start this project now at the Mellon Foundation. Uh, we, in doing this, you know, one of the things people will say immediately, and we all thought the same thing, two-year project, like that doesn't make any sense. Everything's moving way too fast for that. So there are pieces and parts that continue to progress along iteratively as we're doing this project to assess the impact of these things and explore how the institutions can use them differently and create strategies around it. Um, one of the first things that's come out of this project uh, is, you know, it was said earlier, um, uh, I think it was by Elias, uh, about 
you know, just AI literacies and the urgent priority that there is uh, on campuses, and maybe it was Leo in the previous session, um, getting, you know, sort of the precise understanding of how these things are actually used, what they do, and, and what faculty and students need to learn, um, how generative AI works, and, and what are the barriers to engagement in understanding how these things work, and obviously university policies and procedures about how to, how to, how to handle equitable access and how these things are impacting the, 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 the learning and education process and the research process, obviously. One of the things that has come out of this early project is something uh, was mentioned earlier, it was uh, Elias that said this, uh, about the uh, AI product tracker that we have. Um, Ithaca SNR has put out this product tracker, uh, which, which basically has descriptions of different products. I mean, those 20 institutions or 19 institutions, you know, see a lot of different products. And we're, we're really focusing here on products that are specifically for education or higher education. And it, you know, it's a simple tool. It's not perfectly comprehensive, but we're, we're putting in um, all, all the products that we're hearing about, and it includes you know, basic data about what they are, what's, are they a price, uh, do they have a pricing model around them, uh, how do they work, that kind of thing. And, and it's, you know, we're just continuing to build it and adapt it and uh, uh, develop it over time. Uh, and so I think that's a, it, it's a helpful, a helpful tool. Uh, I also want to commend um, this uh, issue brief that goes along with the product tracker. Uh, that was uh, written by Dylan and also uh, uh, Claire Baitosh, uh, uh, another one of our Ithaca S and our colleagues. Uh, that it's a really great overview of of the of the, the the things that we're learning about these products in the early stage and classifies those products and some of the themes that come out. And I I give full credit to them for this. Um, I just want to highlight. So it breaks down the products into, into three different types. Uh, discovery and sometimes products go over more than one of these, but but discovery how how some are using Gen AI to to aid in discovery, how some of these products are working on understanding, which is what we're going to talk about today. How how users can understand the content better by using these tools, and then also uh, creation things like you know advanced AI versions of Grammarly, you know, where things can anticipate what you're trying to write, maybe improve your academic language, those types of things. There are products that are getting created in the area of like actually creating content. Um, some of the themes that, that come out that they talk about in this issue brief, um, uh, you know, obviously those, those tools that, that reach many, many users have, have an advantage in, in the sense that they get more data and can use that data to inform their products. Um, you know, another thing is I, uh, one of the things that OpenAI has done, in addition to having those 180 million users, what they did is they created an API over their uh, language model that allows uh, companies to deploy these. And the consequence of that is that many, many, many companies, I mentioned earlier, Glean and, and those other companies in the commercial sphere, but in our sphere, uh, most of these products in the product tracker are overlaid on, on uh, OpenAI and their API. And so that's, you know, one of the things about that is right now that's kind of dominating the landscape. Um, and, you know, that'll have implications of a variety of kinds, but it's just, it's something worth noting. And people should know that, um, you all probably know in this audience, but each time you send the query, there's a charge. So there's a cost associated with that. You know, what is that going to look like? Is that going to go up? Is that going to go down? How is that going to play out? Um, typically, so far, they'll, each release, they kind of raise the price on the better release and lower the price on the previous release, but nevertheless, there's a lot to be thought about in terms of business models there. And then how will these technologies and become embedded in the teaching process? There are some of these, you know, when you think about scale and how, you know, yesterday's talk was talking about how, how commercial scale is so large compared to universities. Now, you know, how do you do these partnerships? ASU has a partnership with OpenAI. I don't really know what that means. Like, what are they going to build? How is that going to change? Are some of the institutions that have the resources to do these kinds of collaborations going to be way ahead of institutions that don't have that, that kind of scale? Those are things to be, to be watched, at, that we're all watching out for. So as we go, uh, with, with, those, with those sort of highlights of what we're doing, um, I just want to introduce uh, Beth now. Beth Lepensi is our, our, our product uh, leader for our Gen AI research tool. And when we originally got excited about what was happening uh, with, with ChatGPT, we kind of stood up this project and said, okay, we have to do this really fast. Like we have to get 
a beta of a research assistant on the platform before the fall semester. This was in the early spring last year, and Beth, Beth stepped up and, and led that group to do that, and so she's the best person to be here uh, to talk about uh, what, we're, what we're doing with our, our research tool, and we'll, we'll go ahead and, and, and walk you through it, but I just want to say that, that, that the goal here is to show you what we're learning, uh, not to promote the product. We don't have a product. We're not charging for this product. It's a beta. Uh, we're sharing what what we're seeing and what, what the uh, changes are going to potentially mean for all of us who are serving students and faculty in this domain. All right, so as Kevin described, we got started in the spring with this very intensive um, effort. And this, we, we worked with a team of about 20 people, engineers, data science engineers, designers, researchers, et cetera. Um, and really wanted to get something put together as quickly as possible. It took us about six to eight weeks to do this. Um, and what we wanted to do with that speed is really get, um, the quicker we would get this beta out and into the hands of us users, the sooner we would start learning. And um, we, even from before the beta was available, we were, um, working with users and um, building out that, uh, the capabilities with that feedback in mind. Um, so one of the main things that we had to do during this early stage of the build out was really figure out what, what the scope needed to be, what capabilities did we want to build. Uh, our early proof of concept covered a whole range. Um, as Kevin described, there was discovery and understanding and creation. We were working in both the discovery and the understanding space and um, really ended up focusing in on the content itself, understanding and enabling users to um, deeply engage with the material. Um, and we'll get to discovery as uh, another stage of the work. Um, and then the rollout strategy, we chose this beta um, approach because we wanted to bring this into the community in a very controlled way where we can have um, a small number of users react to what we're learning, build it out, and keep, keep rolling that out. And these numbers across the bottom represent where we are today. Um, all right, so now I'm going to run through a few screenshots that really illustrate what our tool does currently so that you can have that context as we go through um, the findings. So this is a JSTOR article page. This is an article that we're looking at. Um, and you can see up at the top, um, I've run a search. The search is what are characteristics of Gothic literature? And in this, on the side, you see we have this new um, chat box um, where the user can engage with the content. And this very first action, the user doesn't have to do anything. They land on the page, and as long as they've run a search, we um, immediately process a prompt that says what, um, in your voice, um, how is the query you put in? So how is, what are the characteristics of Gothic literature related to this text? Um, and the response comes back, the characteristics of Gothic literature include evoking fear, et cetera. So it gives you a um, custom response, um, a custom summary of the document that uh, tells you basically why did I get this response? Why did I get this article and here, what it actually has to do with your research task. So custom summary. Um, then you can see across the bottom, we have a set of like preset prompts. These are very highly optimized to generate um, responses that we've, we've crafted. So the first one is, what is this text about? This is a summary of the entire document. Um, for JSTOR and many, many journals in humanities and social sciences, um, as in this article here, there's not a summary, I'm sorry, an abstract built in to the document. And so this summary is really important for getting that very quick understanding of what the document is about. Um, we have recommend topics. So the user, if you are seeking additional paths of research, you can use this feature. Um, some of the topics that appear here are gothic no novel as formulaic genre, 
Gothic novel as a literary experience and so on. So you get up to 10 um, possible um, searches. These are search terms, so you can click on those and execute a semantic search and get more content that's similar to this one in these specific um, topics. Um, then you can engage with the show me related content option and this generates up to 10 similar, conceptually similar documents um, like uh, recommenders. And then finally, um, you are able to talk to the document. So you click on ask a question about this text, you can execute a question in this case. The question was, what does this say about the castle of Otranto, a Gothic, Gothic novel? Um, so it describes the document mentions that the castle of Otranto, et cetera, and goes on for a paragraph about um, the mention, how that topic is covered in the document. And one thing I'll point out, you can see there's a few footnotes in here, two, two that are called out. Um, for any instance where, in most cases, the users will be able to trace back from the response to the point in the article where that um, information was um, pulled from. So you can see arrow pointing to the highlighted text that is the start of the segment that was used to generate that answer. So Beth, I don't know if I, Beth and I agreed we were going to have a conversation here. I don't know if I make this, this work, but anyway, I'll just I'll just speak loudly. Um, maybe just say a word about why why we're focused on being in the article, right? Like a lot of people are doing searches and thinking about across the whole corpus. What were the reasons for staying like? grounded in the article as we did this work. Yeah, let me just advance. No, well, not yet. Um, so there's a few reasons why we started with this article scope. So one is that um, we did really want to bring the, um, the most possible, uh, the greatest possible value to our users. And this is the, the many of the um, challenges that we see w with our users is really being able to work quickly through this, um, this kind of workflow. Um, and then we wanted to really make sure that the, um, the experience that the user had was very trustworthy and the traceability was there. So in this specific example, it's very clear where this came from. There's a uh, very little chance that uh, we'll be pulling in um, information that's not in this document. So it's very clear we put these um, guardrails up that keep the user within the scope of this document. Um, so yeah, encourage the trust and um, reliability of the responses. Um, all right, so how does this work? I wanted to give this picture um, of what's actually happening behind the scenes, especially with this question and answer. Um, so first, I will say that we're using um, a combination of OpenAI's um, GPT 3.5 to do this, as well as some open source, smaller open source models to um, generate the, um, the vectors for the semantic search. So it's all working in combination. So what happens, the user types in the questions. So what we just saw was, um, what does this say about the castle of Otranto? You type that in. The system, when they hit enter, the system is generating a vector, um, a conceptual representation of that question. Um, so that's the question is vectorized. Um, and then we use that vector to identify all of the relevant portions within that text. So the, um, the document, the article that we were looking at has already been processed, broken into chunks of text and vectors created. So we basically use the question to run a search against the document to find which sections are relevant and are likely going to contain the answer to the question. So then we take the question the user put in, the text from the document, the sections of text, and um, a, a prompt that we have carefully created to um, give precise instructions on how to process that. So all of that is sent to OpenAI. The prompt, it follows the prompt instructions, uses only, it's instructed very clearly to only use content that is in the segments of text that we selected, and it generates a response. Then we get that response back and we show it to the user.
Um, all right, so how do we... I, I might just oh, add yeah, one, thing, one thing on that is that in, in that process, um, that query is not training an LLM. It's not actually retained by the LLM by, by virtue of the license between it. And uh, we don't actually train an LLM model in doing this work, either, either theirs or our own. Yep. So we go through quite a process to make sure that um, the responses that come back are actually um, high quality and relevant. There's two main paths that we take. There's some human evaluation. Um, you will have seen, I didn't point it out, let me scroll back. You can see after each one of the responses that are submitted, we have um, a user rating ability as well as a submit feedback below. So we're constantly collecting um, feedback from users on their perception of what is, of the quality of the response. Um, they can do positive and negative rating. If they do negative, they get an additional um, set of options where they can flag why it was negative. So inaccurate, incomplete, confusing, or harmful, and then give a description. So. This information comes in, we constantly review this. Um, we have people like myself and my lead engineer review these things every morning and get a sense of what's going on, but we also do um, programmatic analysis of this data. Um, generally, I will say that um, about 80% of the feedback that we get is positive. Um, the negative feedback we get through this mechanism is generally because the user is trying to do something that the tool doesn't do, or, um, or do, it's either designed not to do, or it hasn't been built out to do yet. Um, and then we have, and this is a, a work in progress, we have automated mechanisms for assessing several different aspects of the responses. So toxicity, um, this is measuring, using a hate speech model, we are able to um, generate a score across the body of content that um, tells us like how, how harmful it is. Um, and we've done this work in a test set and we're working on doing it across the, the whole body. Um, similarly, there's a faithfulness score, um, which allows us to measure with the response how how close it is to the content in the document. Um, relevancy is just what it sounds like, is how much does the, how close of a match is this for the question that was asked? And we would measure this relevancy in a similar way that we do with search. Um, and then similarity is, um, another is similar to faithfulness, but it is really looking at the, the scope of what is in the response and making sure that it's complete. Well, one thing to highlight about, about this is that uh, it, it raises the question of, of whether you mediate or don't. And I think this is, you know, in general, what we, when we're talking today, we're going to be talking about things that relate to us, but, but as much trying to extrapolate out to, like, what the role in the library is, because you all are going to be seeing all these tools, not just from us, but from everyone else. So this question of mediation is a big one. So, like, we get a question that looks like it's obviously the exam question. You know, do we answer it? If, do we know if it's the exam question? What what level of mediation do you do, or do you step out when you see these questions? So, you know, right now we're not mediating, but it's a, it's an open question as to whether one should or shouldn't, except for in these areas of like toxicity and stuff. Yeah. Um, all right. So we're not going to go into detail on this slide, but what I wanted to show you was um, each of these lines that we're looking at represents the features that I walked through on the um, in the screenshots. I mean, you can see a big difference here between the blue and red and then the orange and green. So the blue one is the question and answer feature. Most popular, most users are engaging with that, um, followed by summaries. Um, the two that aren't highly used are the topics and related items, the two discovery features, which um, is very kind of surprising to me. Um, but it tells us something really interesting. The users are very drawn to the conversational aspect and this, um, this interaction around unpacking and interrogating the content of the document um, to further their understanding. Um, along with these data, we also see that um, session duration and number of pages visited during 
a session are extremely higher than um, non-beta users, so uh, over double, um, over double. So that's really great to see that, the, that it's really driving that kind of engagement. All right, so here, um, just talk about summarize for a second. So this, if you recall, is when the user clicks, what is this item about? And it produces a paragraph or so that describes the, the content. Um, this is, um, actually this user is referring to both versions, the custom summary and the general summary. Um, and this is a quote that came in through the feedback mechanism. Um, and I just wanna call out how interesting this is. Um, so they say, I really love this tool. It is great how it attempts to relate the search query back to the content in the article. I find that I'm spending more time capturing and downloading the AI summaries than the downloading the PDFs. Um, they go on to say that um, my current research process is to do a search, open a bunch of tabs, copy the summaries and the citations into a text file, and then review the contents later. Um, and then later go back and get the down, uh, PDFs to download. Um, and there, this was really a request for all of that to happen in one, one click. <laughs> um, so it's just a really great example of how the presence of these capabilities are already starting to change how the user engages with the content. One, one other thing to add about the summaries, um, the, the potential for the summaries is, is incredibly powerful because um, translation, obviously, I mean, JSTOR is available all over the world and uh, it's mostly all in English language, but if, if these summaries could be translated in all these different languages, the level of access for, for people from those different uh, languages is, is hugely higher. And, and it, we have a lot of secondary schools, about 3,000 or more that have access, so being able to do translations that are at reading level or grade level. Um, so there's all kinds of potential there in addition to these new ways of using the summaries uh, that, that really change the way that the users engage and can engage with the resource and, and has applications for accessibility as well. Yeah. All right, so question and answer, the most popular feature. What is it, What are they actually asking? What do these conversations look like? Um, so looking at the data and this, like, we have mm, thousands of questions come in every day. And so it is, um, we do, like I mentioned before, with the feedback, we do a combination of um, human review, which is, again, myself and uh, my lead engineer do a lot of um, kind of scanning of this. But then we've also been doing, using um, LLM uh, GPT-4 internally to process large um, amounts of this data so that we can really start to understand the nature of the questions, what's coming in, how many fall into which category, things like that, um, both for our own understanding of what users are doing, but also um, in some cases we can see like there's a whole body of things that aren't working well and so we can categorize those and then follow up on them and see um, an example of that, which I didn't call out here, um, is users typing in, give me a summary, or give me a longer summary, or translate this summary. Right now, the tool doesn't do that, but we can really see that that is something that our users are actually wanting and asking for. Um, so at this 70%, um, the big category, really are a variety of categories of users attempting to understand the content that they're working with, which no surprise, that's what we designed it for, but it's great to see that that's what's happening. Um, the kinds of questions that come in fall into these categories. There's miscellaneous as well, but um, the most common is, does this article mention the topic I'm interested in? Um, does it mention this? Does it mention that? Um, and even a whole series of these. Um, so what's happening here, I believe, is that users are, the first thing that they're trying to do is really evaluate. They've had a few other mechanisms, but then they get into it and really want to see, like, how does it cover this topic? Is it on this version of this topic or another version? Um, and so they're kind of it's like control F, but for the concepts rather than for the words. Um, so we see that the most. Um, then the next one is that we see a, um, 
uh, questions about the nature of the discussion on a certain topic. And so these are much more refined and detailed questions. Um, I interpret these ones as a more advanced researcher who has something very specific in mind and they're trying to see how, that, how that's playing out in the literature. The next one is very definitional, just what is this concept? So in the example we were looking at earlier, what is the Gothic response? Um, what is this even talking about? So um, this would be likely um, an undergraduate student or someone who's new to the field that they're doing this research in. And so it's helping them to, to level set and understand what they're working with. Um, what methods are used? Um, so basically logistics around the creation of the document. Um, and then in kind of a lesser amount, um, how are our two concepts related? And these, again, I think are the more advanced scholars trying to really um, unpack and identify connections and new, new concepts. Um, the 30%, the things that uh, don't fall into those categories, like I had mentioned, things that the tool can't do and won't do. Um, we have made choices to not do certain things. Um, help with creating, we'll see some examples of this. Um, help, me, help me write a paper, help me identify how to do this thing. Um, and then uh, the humorous ones are people testing the tool, trying to push boundaries and just seeing what they can get away with. Okay. Have anything before? Okay. Um, all right. So now we've learned all these things. Um, we've all we've done a range of user interviews, data analysis, um, info coming in from all directions, and so what we want to do now is um, look at these main categories of users and how they're experiencing the tool. Um, so the first group here is novice researchers. These can be our high school students, undergrads, even master's students. Um, and what they're trying to do in general is um, find and evaluate materials for relevance. This is a main, main job that these people have. And then learning how, not yet doing, solidly, but really learning how to develop hypotheses and write academically, so they're very early in this process. And why do they like the AI tool that we've built? How, why does it matter to them? Um, it helps them get to the right material faster. And the right material, you'll see again in the next slide, this is very dependent on the user and what they're trying to accomplish. Um, it helps them to develop a framework to probe the material and understand why it's relevant to them um, and to also make this content, the scholarly content, more accessible to them. Um, so we have a quote here. I won't read the whole thing, but you can read. Um, so this student says, I get more out of the article. I want to read the article anyway, but the tool would prepare me to get more out of it, like it's Shakespeare. You know, <clears throat> excuse me. You know the plot beforehand, um, so that you can really get into it. I understand this. I'm prepped, and then when I go to read it, I actually can um, absorb the information. Okay. So now we have a few examples of um, some actual conversations that happen. So in this case, um, the student, and I will say, in some cases, we can tell this is what role the users are. In some cases, we don't know. So um, we are expecting this to be um, a student. Um, how can this paper be useful for a person who wants to create a civic education curriculum for middle school students in the Ukraine? That's actually a teacher. Um, I see now. Um, but what happens? So this is the question from the user and then um, the response, the, an abbreviated response. It was longer than this. Um, but what you can see is um, uh, broken down by section ways to accomplish this task. So one thing I just want to highlight right now is that um, before this, the level of engagement that like 99% of, of JSTOR users would have with the interface would be to hit print. Like literally, like or download PDF. And so the activity that would have normally happened outside that space, somewhere else with a 
professor or teacher or colleague or a librarian or reference librarian or whatever, that's happening in here. And that's going to happen in all the tools, you know, very soon. That the, like the difference is, is literally between almost nothing in the resource to all this activity that you're seeing in, this, in these examples. Um, and here are a handful of other examples. Um, and I'd love to hear your hear your reactions um, to these different different things. Um, write an annotated bibli bibliography for this document. Make sure to summarize the author's arguments, sources, methods, and conclusions. <laughs> um, can you find quotes to put into an essay to support my opinion that Galileo thinks religion and science are compatible? Um, what does the second paragraph on page five mean? Um, write, I'm not going to read this whole one, um, but write an essay that describes the author's insights about abiding in and so on. Um, write an essay that, that may be testing the tool. Um, in some cases, like Kevin mentioned, um, in some cases we are, the tool does answer these things currently. Um, another reason why we are, we're squarely in a beta state is so that we can identify these and understand them. Um, some of these may be indication of a student who is not familiar enough with how to do these tasks and if they're asking for help. Um, or it might be somebody who just wants, um, wants some stuff done for them. Um, so yeah, we've got some, got some work to do to really understand how best to handle these different kinds of requests. The next user group is uh, experienced researchers. So these may be PhD students, faculty, independent researchers. And the tasks that they are trying to accomplish are finding the right material and developing conceptual, novel conceptual relationships across subject areas and content types. So they're very exploratory looking to, to find evidence for um, the, the topics that they're covering. Um, and the JSTOR AI tool matters to them because um, these two main reasons, it helps to democratize research by providing uh, RA, RA support. Um, we've seen examples and talked talking to, um, to faculty where they don't have, they're at an institution where they don't have the budget to have um, research assistants working with them. This can help them be more efficient with their work, um, as an example. Um, and it makes it easier to probe concepts and get related items behind um, to expand on that uh, target and scope. So it makes it easier to easier and faster to get through um, the range of work that they're trying to do. Um, and in this example, um, I didn't mention these are users who we actually talk to. So these are quotes from interviews. Um, I quite often would like to ask my research assistant to go and explore for me. Part of what they would be looking for is who is mentioned, what reference, what arguments do they mention, what school of thoughts. So this would be a very simple way and um, it would certainly make their lives easier. Um, all right, so here are a handful of examples that are the type that I described, which are much more um, detailed in nature, um, more specific. So I'm not going to read all of these, um, but using this case, explain thoroughly, explain thoroughly why it is so difficult to strike the right balance between restorative and retributive justice. Um, does the text draw any principles or concepts from the field of positive psychology um, and so on? So these are much more nuanced in their nature. And then the third group is instructors. Um, so this might be instructional librarians or faculty teaching courses. Um, and they are in search of support for execution of student research and support in the development of research skills of their students. Um, and the tool matters to them because it helps them to teach students how to find and evaluate materials and in a new way um, than how they've done in the past. It helps with assignment creation and it helps to facilitate the group conversations on how to develop research, 
perspectives. Um, we have had very interesting um, scenarios where we're in a limited beta, so you have to have a personal account and be granted in. Um, and we have many um, examples, even though we haven't invited instructors and classes to join, that they're sending these requests in. Can you add my entire class into the beta so that we can work with it? And so this is an example of these group conversations really working with the whole class. Um, and in this one, it says it makes research interactive. I think it would change how I teach, that it would be a little less introductory. I'm not gonna read this whole thing, but you can, I'll leave it up here for a second. You can scan through. But essentially, this is like how changing the way that this um, user, Muriel, um, really even thinks about the way that she would teach a course. So I think that's a very great example. Um, and just a few examples here. Um, a instructor might ask, we saw this, a few examples like this. Um, what would be questions to ask a college history class about this article? Um, there's other similar ones like um, what would in class possible in class essays be for this article, things like that. Um, and then another one here says, um, how would one make a PowerPoint um, following the, the <laughs> this concept in the document? And so it's the response, it was quite lengthy. Um, I couldn't fit it all on the screen, but it goes through and says like here, here's a, basically a slide roadmap for you to build that PowerPoint slide off of this document, uh, which is very exciting. Um, all right, so in summary, we have this one um, kind of comprehensive quote from this faculty member, Andy. He says, I can do in a day what used to take me four or five days. AI isn't doing any of the intellectual work for me. I'm still having to come to grips with what the concepts mean, what the particular author is trying to say, and how I can integrate what they're saying into something of public value. It's not doing the thinking for me, it is showing me where to look. And this, this is a great um, in the summary quote, um, and this is really exactly what we're looking for and hope to hear more users expressing the same um, opinion. And that's it. We'll open it up for questions. Those two links at the bottom. <laughs> Uh, product tracker and the um, issue brief for that. Um, so we'll open up for questions. Thank you so much for this presentation. I'm, I'm interested because you know, like with Control F, it's very clear when something is or isn't there, and it's very clear to the user what the boundaries are. I feel like to some extent this is like the most direct application of literary theory I can think of in terms of how much do you see a text independent of other texts. So I'm thinking, for example, if you're working with like a reference librarian and they were to give you a certain article, they may say, now FYI, this has been disproven, or FYI, this is a racist article, fundamentally, or you know, whatever. Um, to what extent is the advice and guidance just kind of only dependent on that article, not able to say, FYI, this has actually been disproven? You know, for, and how do you set that boundary? Like with Control F, there's a very clear boundary. How do you yeah. set that expectation with the user FYI, I don't know about the constellation of publications that may have later rejected this premise. How, how do you how do you think about that, setting the expectation and, and the boundaries for what AI knows and doesn't know about the context for the text? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we do have a little bit of um, helper text around the tool and some help information, ways to to help give a user a path to learn that information. Um, we don't really believe that most users will seek that out though, right? And so we have, we do have some work to do. Um, right now, the tool can only answer questions that can be derived from the material. So it can't even do questions, which we see a lot, like, um, is this peer reviewed? We will, like, we'll figure out how to do that is a very common question. Um, and so that context setting is really an important thing that we um, we have been thinking about. There is, we, we need to figure that out, essentially, yeah. 
Um, and I also did not mention we're working right now on just the item that you're looking at. Um, we have work in progress where we start to um, broaden that scope. So for example, um, if you're looking at a book chapter and you're asking a question, we want that tool to be able to answer that question from the entire book, um, for example. And so even in that case, having that context of like, here's what's going on and how what you're doing here sits within the larger context, so. These yeah. are the exact questions though, right? Because uh, yeah. for one, sometimes that student might be at an institution that doesn't have that reference library, or that reference library has a particular perspective on whether that context is one way or the other. And so in, there's, only, there's, there's the potential for this to have that context in every case, but who judges which, which side it goes on, which is, which is where it gets really, really powerful and uh, challenging, right? And yeah. Because you can see that. Whereas in the current environment, that happens a million times all over in every different library, but nobody really knows which advice was given in which case. Whereas here, you do know. So what does that mean? How do you deploy that? How do you not deploy that? Sort of the issues of mediation or non-mediation. So huge questions around this that we'll, we, we surely don't have the answers for, but we'll try to learn. Is, is there potential, kind of following on that, is there potential for integration with other tools that the library and the school might have in terms of library and chat or setting up consultations mm. once it gets to the point where they may Oh, interesting idea. How we haven't thought about that. Um, that's something that would be appealing. Like when we can tell that they've hit a wall, maybe bump them into into their um, library environment somehow. Is that? Yeah, yeah interesting. Um, in the back. This is really great. Um, thank you so much, Kevin. You said something that sort of uh, got me thinking. So um, not surprising, perhaps, that I'll ask a question about user privacy. Um, you just said, like, oh, it used to be the thing that we most saw was download or print, and we didn't know what happened with the article. I can totally understand why it'd be valuable to know what's happening with the article, and that immediately raised all the flags in my head that we know about other platforms where readers have been tracked and mm -hmm. then data. Um, in some cases, it's not been kept secure. So I guess I'm, and I'm thinking of JSTOR in particular because you have this platform where you're not the publisher. So I can imagine publishers who are putting content on your platform are going to perhaps want to know more and more. Like, don't just tell me how many times it was printed and downloaded. Tell me how people are interacting with mm -hmm. my work. So have you given any thought to your privacy and data, a user data policy apparatus around, yes, you, you're going to have amazing data, but where should that data go? And should be able to use it. Yeah, I mean, I think we're these are these are the questions for um, uh, all all providers in in all contexts here, right? So, I think that um, for one, right now, obviously you have to get user permission, and we don't share the privacy data; we disambiguate the privacy data. But in the beta right now, we're obviously using these data, but not with. The, you know, the individuals actually write us and give us these comments that we're sharing. So I think the question of, of user privacy and protecting user privacy, which is obviously critically important in libraries and to the publishers as well, is, is one that we're going to continue to learn about and we're going to have to protect. So, um, you know, I think when, you code, when, you, when you're, you're working on a session like this, we're trying to really show, like, how are the users actually using this? What does this mean? Um, uh, that's that's shows the value of having the data. At the same time, you know, you highlight the the, the challenges and the the restrictions that need to be placed on it to protect user user privacy. But um, you know, for the most part, when we actually deploy this in in full, we'll have to make decisions around whether or not this is around as as we have here, where we have people taking accounts and giving us permission to do certain things, or if it's just in the IP address environment, how would we operate in that in that context without that data? And just to um, emphasize a point that Kevin made about disambiguating the user data, um, we keep that in our logs as um, that we can use for product development and analysis, but it is separated from the individual who did it. Um, so in the same way that we do with our search queries, for example, we're able to um, 
uh, analyze and um, identify trends and so forth, um, but not in a way that tells us anything about a particular user. Um, I think there's someone behind you, yeah. So I have a comment and a question. Um, my, my comment is to sort of second what, where you were going with this. I, I love JSTOR. I always have, but when I was a frontline librarian, it was always a little frustrating to me the, um, the, how all of the users knew JSTOR until when I would say, where did you search JSTOR? Um, and then they, they didn't really understand what that then meant that they were searching, right? And, um, you know, full disclosure, science librarian, that meant something. <laughs> right. Um, and so that's one of the things that um, <coughs> that I think would be really important for a user to understand what this tool allows them yeah. to explore and what it doesn't. And it would be amazing if you were able to create those links to other resources the library might have or the librarians or that sort of thing. So yeah. <laughs> plus one, <laughs> heavy plus one for that. But my question is sort of um, going back to the idea of making the content accessible um, as an understandable, but also making the content accessible mm -hmm. accessibility. Um, your product is used by, and, and your, your slides uh, very much illustrated this, it's used by um, a lot of different um, user levels, right? So you've got K through 12, yeah. you've got undergrad. Um, and I wonder if you thought at all about the summaries that you're generating and being able to sort of tune them expert to, to non-expert or, yeah. you know, various reading levels, things like that. And then the other thing that I wonder, that I was wondering when you were talking about accessibility and being able to, to make it translate, and I was wondering if you were thinking also about um, making the summaries available via audio. Or, oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, so you asked about basically allowing the user to like edit <laughs> edit the the characteristics of the pro of the um, summary and yes right now we have one standard summary um, but we have been talking about different ways like um, potentially a slider that's like. Um, I don't know what characteristics we would put, but easy to hard um, to allow a user to to adjust that. We also see a lot of um, requests for make this summary smaller, give it to me in bullet points, make it richer, give me more bullets. So um, I think there's some um, another kind of slider, which is uh, the level of detail. Um, so yes, we're we're looking into those um, those options. Um, and your site, the other summary question, remind me. Yes, um, we have not thought about audio, um, but now we will. Um, we have we have um, an accessibility expert um, on staff, and we've been working with him to do some analysis of the tool to see um, which um, within our um, community of differing um, abilities, what um, even in its current state, which scenarios might we already be providing greater values. So there is definitely a stream of um, thought around um, accessibility. Yeah. So from the general search of the entire database, mm -hmm. um, does that take natural language queries? Now? Yeah, we're starting. Um, so if you're in the beta, um, we have the typical keyword-based JSTOR search with an option to view the um, natural language search, and we're working to figure out how to blend that all together. Um, it's a work in progress, so we didn't show it today. So my question then is, yeah. what are the guardrails around what types of questions that will answer like the topic summary? For instance, can somebody say, um, you know, what is the relationship between Gothic literature and uh, other types of literature, science fiction? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, with just the natural language searching, it's still returning individual documents. So in that example, it would look for documents that covered that um, comparison. Um, 
However, we're also working on bringing the kind of um, chat capabilities that we just went through up to the search level, um, which would allow a user to potentially, you've got a search results, we've got 25 on the first page, maybe you pick five or 10 tick box them and then use that tool to um, interrogate all of those documents at the same time and um, generate the, see like, how is this topic covered in this range of articles? How, like, how can we synthesize that? And so getting to that kind of um, looking at and understanding a range of documents at the same time is um, next step. I'm interested in the 30% uh, queries that are not about understanding the yeah. document. And I'm particularly interested in one of the subcategories, and, and that is the queries uh, regarding things that the tool won't do. Mm -hmm. Not can't get to, but won't. Yeah. So, and I have two questions about that. Number one, what does the tool say when you ask it to do something it won't do? Yeah. And number two, how do you internally decide what it will and won't do? Um, well, at this moment, the things that we, we have a list of forbidden tasks, um, which I don't have in my brain, but I can check my notes after. Um, but we don't want them to be um, them. I, talking about it like it's a person. Um, we don't want the tool to be um, offering opinions, for example. We don't want it to um, uh, take content from OpenAI. It could. I mean, we could open those guardrails and let it use its knowledge from anywhere to answer the question, so that's forbidden. Um, so we have a range of those things. So the big one is really around opinions. Um, we don't want, we want the tool to really focus on um, exposing the content of the document rather than um, interpreting that. So that is the big, like, no, no. Currently, we can do more of that um, as we understand more. Um, what it does do, like if you typed in a question, very similar to if you typed in a question where the content just couldn't answer it, or if it was a question where we didn't do it, it just says, I can't, I can't do that. So if we were demoing, I would show you. I can show you later if you want. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think it uses those um, words. The prompt says something like politely um, state that you're an AI tool and you can't do that thing. Yeah. At the moment, it's restricted to an individual article, oh, but we will get into the search experience soon. Okay, but yeah. you are saying that you don't have that article. Yeah. So did you find that, yeah, so there was actually a question, so it seems like that makes sense that the platform that we are and it's easier for either to check it immediately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I would be very curious to learn what you can go there, whether you get any questions about the comprehensiveness of yeah. the searches, because that is a barrier that we get mm -hmm. back to the results of the comprehensive, yep. while the results would be sort of like more of a fudge, and people would get very uh, like mixed responses to that. But you have to go there, so that's OK. But another question that I have really I will, before you ask that question, though, the scenario you're talking about does actually happen in this single item where, because um, I described how the, the process of answering a question is essentially using the question to run a search across the document, and then the search results are segments of the document. And so getting, having our system find the right segments that's a thing that we need to pay close attention to because sometimes if we say this is the this is the passage that answers that question, but there were three other passages that should also form the answer, they flag incomplete. Like that is one of the things that we do see um, that this this answer you gave me is incomplete. So we do. 
Yeah, and that's one of the um, automated evaluation mechanisms that I described is job is to do exactly that. Like, yes, it might be accurate, but it's not complete enough. And so we have to look at accuracy and completeness. Yeah, so my follow question was exactly what that So each one of the different um, evaluations has a different a different tool. So in some cases, we're using um, uh, other models to compare. In a lot of cases, what we're doing um, is this um, concept of using LLM as judge. And so there's a there's a practice and developing field around automated evaluations, and very few of them are very effective. And so this um, using LLM as a judge is the is one of the newer methods, and we're using using that. So in the case of the um, the harmful content, there is a specialized model that we're using to compare. Um, in other cases, we're using GPT-4 to validate GPT-3 because it produces more um, accurate results. Um, and then for the other two that were on the list, um, which were relevance and completeness maybe, um, we're, what we're doing there is building out a data set, which we're calling a ground truth data set, which is validated question and answer pairs for specific documents. And so that is being first created using um, GPT-4. Um, and then we're having, we'll, this data set will be human curated, um, where we'll identify, like, here's a, here's a preliminary answer to that question, and you, smart person, read this article and assess the quality of this response. And so when we have this data set, um, starting with like a thousand, we've done it with like a hundred so far, right? All human curated. Um, doing this at scale will allow us to really have this um, example of in, these are a hundred percent correct. We are highly confident in this and then being able to use that to model, um, like to extrapolate from there and test iterations on our model. So um, in all cases, it's using some other LLM besides the one that we're using to produce the response to the user. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So we're hearing the, the sounds of, of, of completion and lunch yeah, we're uh, all in done. the background. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming, and we really appreciate it.